Wow. Welcome everyone. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us for this evening's expert panel with Janet McCallum, Emma Dawson, Emma Germano and Rob Moody discussing what happens next, reconstructing Australia after COVID-19. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently broadcasting from, the Yagara and Turbal people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present, present and emerging and acknowledge that this was and always will be Aboriginal land. Before I hand over to our speakers this evening, I'd first just like to reiterate some of the information that was mentioned to you in the email you were sent earlier. You've all been automatically been placed on mute and will remain so throughout the event, but I will unmute everyone at the end of the evening so you can join me in thanking our speakers for tonight's discussion. Uh, they will, all our speakers will be keen to answer your questions towards the end of the event, if there's time. So please start sending them through to me as you think of them using the chat box. Um, if you can't see it, then you can find the button that will open it towards the bottom left of your screen. Your questions will come straight through to me and I will read them out along with your name as soon as I'm prompted to do so. I'd also like to mention that at Avid Reader, we have a special promotion for everyone in attendance tonight. If you use the code EVENT at checkout, you will receive 10% off all books ordered from our website within the next 24 hours. Um, I will post your link to purchase your copy of What Happens Next shortly. Uh, so make sure you grab your copies early to make the most of that discount. I would now like to introduce Professor Janet McCalman, AC. Janet is known for her award-winning books, Struggle Town, Journeyings and Sex and Suffering. As a Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, she has always been fascinated by the experience of historical cohorts and the interplay between private life and the public world of politics and policy. She has taught the ecological history of humanity and the history and politics of public health. Janet's research has included major cradle to grave studies of white settler poverty, Aboriginal Victorians, former Tasmanian convicts and the first Australian Imperial force. For the latter two, she worked with volunteer genealogists and retired health professionals. For seven years, she wrote an opinion column for The Age. Janet, I'd now like to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Greetings everyone. And those of us from other Aboriginal lands also pay our respects. I think three of us are on the Wurundjeri land and Emma Gamano, I think would be on Kurnai country. So we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Emma Dawson and I, about eight months ago, formed a friendship entirely through media. We have never met in the flesh. Uh, she doesn't know how tall I am, probably doesn't know that I use a crutch. Um, anyway, um, and we decided that we really felt a book was needed to start everyone talking and thinking about um, what happens next? How do we reconstruct Australia after this incredible disruption that we've been through? A disruption that is also linked to the deeper disruptions which are coming in climate change and, and are, are exacerbated by inequality. Australia is a good country, a very lucky country, but we still don't do things very well. And the theme for tonight is about food. Food is extraordinary in that no one in politics has it on their agenda. They might have water or agriculture in terms of growing uh, cereal crops or growing cattle or the live cattle trade or live sheep trade, but the real business of food that we consume every day, 24 seven, keeps us alive, keeps the whole life and economy going, is simply not on the political agenda. And yet our production of food in Catenfold has faces deep problems from climate change, from labor regulation and lack of it, from lack of proper finance, from lack of uh, protection against predatory uh, distributors such as the big, um, uh, uh, big sort of companies and, and the, especially the supermarkets. And so we're going to talk about food from two angles. First from Emma Germano, who comes to us from Mirbu in 
Gippsland, where she is a mixed farmer, uh, comes from a long line of vegetable growers, uh, but she's also very senior in the Victorian Farmers Federation and a spokesperson in trying to get the politics of food onto the agenda with our, with our system. Our second speaker will be Dr. Professor Rob Moody, um, who's a, a great champion of public health, and we'll talk about him in detail in a minute. And finally, um, Emma Dawson, the co-editor, who is a supreme policy wonk. <laughs> so she, and her essay in our book is about the foundational economy. But first, I'm going to ask Anna Germano, just to, re in a nutshell, in a few minutes, give us the main points of your chapter. What's your big beef, or uh, that you that you really that's a message you really want to get through? I guess there's two things. Um, the, firstly, around this idea that you just said that you know food policy is not really on the menu of. Of, of the government. And um, I, I was interested today because on Twitter, there was some commentary in, in the, um, the chat talking about how, we, you know, that food's overly regulated. The government's always talking about food, but I, I really take your point. I think what really is my beef is that we always slink off to talking about ideology rather than about good ideas to move us forward into the future. And that this country, unlike so many others around the world, is completely lacking in a food plan or a food production plan or a food security plan that, that you know, some countries look at, look at their food security 50 to 100 years into the future. And we've got, a, you know, three year turnaround policies that, you know, we can never really sink our teeth into and we can never really get very far with it. Um, and secondly, I guess... Um, what my beef is, is probably a lack of real understanding about the agriculture industry and how it happens. And the fact that we as farmers probably haven't taken control much of that message and, and telling our own stories and how our stories can be exploited and used against us and how there's a deep disconnection between where food comes from for, I, I think, the majority of um, our Australian population. Most people think that food comes from the supermarket and it might only be for the first time in, in a generation or more that people have finally gotten to a supermarket shelf and seen no food there because of this pandemic um, and it's starting to drive different conversations. So we need to make sure that we're forefront, farmers need to be forefront in that com conversation around how do we rebuild and, and uh, as to many of the essays in the book, not to how do we get back to where we were, but how do we actually reimagine what a, a better future and a sustainable looks like, a sustainable future looks like for farming in this country. Thank you, Emma. Uh, how close do you think we got to being suddenly short of food during the pandemic, early days of the pandemic? Oh, I, probably the reality is that there was plenty of food on our farms and that it was difficult for us to... In fact, the industry came out and told everybody not to panic. Don't panic. Don't worry about it. We've got food on our farms. And I think it was almost to the point of being detrimental because we actually started to be um, marginalised from the conversations around, you know, restrictions and, and shutdowns and quarantines and isolation periods. And, you know, now we've got a country that largely has disintegrated into politics of various states. And as an Australian farmer, we you know, we've always operated in a national system and that's been really, really difficult. And, and there became a disconnect. So in the beginning, there was a focus on food and do we have enough? And it seems as though people said, oh yeah, we do. The farmers have said we do. It's just that we can't get it out onto the shelves quickly enough. It's just a result of panic buying. So nothing to worry about, but there's so many other consequences of the pandemic on the agriculture industry that I think are now starting to um, dwindle a little bit in, in these conversations. Now, I'm going to bring Emma in at this point because Emma's interest is in the foundational economy and people who get food to us through from the farm, grow the food, grow, get it to the supermarket or the market, that's the foundational economy. Emma, do you want to come in at that point? Yes, thanks, Janet. Um, so my... Absolutely, the concept of the foundational economy, and it's a relatively new term to Australia, although quite developed in Europe, um, <clears throat> really recognises those foundational elements of our society and of the, our way of life. So the essential services, the essential products and goods and the essential workers um, that really underpin uh, our day-to-day -day lives. And I think we saw during this, during the acute phase of the pandemic and here in Victoria with just about to emerge, I think from the 
I don't know, it feels like 103 weeks of lockdown. It's a lot less than that. Um, <laughs> but we saw in that time that the, the people, the workers that we relied on and the sectors of the industry and commerce that we relied on were not banking or marketing or um, funds management. They were food producers, food suppliers, cleaners, carers, the people that kept our everyday needs met. Um, and as many workers in the knowledge economy um, were able to retreat behind closed doors and work on their computers and not leave the house. Um, those workers that pick our fruit and vegetables, that um, manage our farms, that manage the supply chains then through warehousing and distribution, supermarkets and deliver that food ultimately to our doors um, were absolutely indispensable. And yet they are amongst the least appreciated and least valued workers in our economy. Um, and the the amount of um, government support and government attention and policy attention that is given to these essential supply chains, because there's nothing more essential than food, um, has been lacking for a long time. So we see in government policy making a lot of attention to cutting edge technologies, to <clears throat> um, high end manufacturing, to export of um, uh, fossil fuels, uh, and to a lot of the more value added industries. And yet these absolutely fundamental parts of our economy that keep us ticking over um, don't get nearly enough attention. And so we are in a situation in Australia where we found now with the um, collapse of immigration and the border restrictions that farmers and food producers can't get uh, the personnel, the, the labour that they need in order to um, pick fruit and vegetables to bring that food to market and they're under an extreme amount of pressure and as Emma said we don't pay attention to that in our policy settings we have taken it for granted um, for so long across the foundational economy from everything from uh, the care of children and elderly people and people with disabilities right through to supermarket workers warehouses delivery drivers agriculture workers those that part of the economy has been taken for granted and left to kind of just muddle through and do its own thing. And unlike a lot of other countries, we don't pay attention to that. And we don't, in the face of what is it going to be, this is an acute crisis, but what is going to be a quite a, a long-term um, challenge and has been for some time, which is climate change, we're not paying enough attention to the changing um, impact on our agriculture sector, on our food production, and on those the disruptions to those international supply chains. It's a massive export industry for Australia. Um, so I do, my chapter calls on us to think more um, deeply about that part of the economy and about the essential function that it serves and to value it more highly and to uh, put more thought into how we can support it and how we can ensure that our children and grandchildren um, benefit from the kind of really fantastic um, quality and availability and freshness of food that we always have here in the past. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Rob Moody, now Rob Moody is uh, a, a public health doctor whose career has spanned working in Aboriginal communities in Africa. He was head of the of Vic Health for many years, health promotion. Now he's a professor in the Melbourne uh, School of Population and Global Health um, and a very powerful teacher um, in, in uh, classrooms as I have seen. But there's another side to food in terms of national policy and world policy which is about health. Um, and so it's simply not just enjoying nice food and getting it and having it at a reasonable price. There's actually a profound concern for health, which governments don't take seriously. Rob, please. Um, thanks, Janet. And thanks very much for the uh, opportunity of, of speaking tonight. And thanks very much for the opportunity to you and Emma for actually um, uh, contributing a, chap a chapter because it really did make uh, me and my colleagues um, um, Tasman and Mike Daub, I think, uh, think a lot. I mean, um, just a bit of context, perhaps. I mean, where I come from is as a, you, I might want to call it a preventologist. Um, so the notion that, you know, prevention is better than cure. Um, it's something that you can ask everybody and 99% of people in the street will say, yes, I believe in that. Um, and yet we don't fund it um, in that. Uh, and we don't actually orient our, our system, a little like Emma Dawson was saying, towards those priorities. Um, and with food, what we've been seeing over the last, you know, literally 50 years is a change, quite a transition in the way food 
um, is, uh, is, is manufactured in particular and is processed. Um, and now we have this glut, if you like, of what we would call ultra processed food. Um, and this is it's almost not food anymore. Um, there's so much, in a sense, additives um, uh, and products added to this uh, in this processing uh, um, continuum that um, you know we've moved a long way from uh, uh, you know fundamentally unprocessed and minimally processed foods that that Emma um, is is growing. Um, and you know we 50% of our calories are coming from this ultra processed food now. Uh, and it's not only the high levels of salt or sugar or, or even fats in it, it's just the actual process, it seems, um, which, is, which is actually being unhealthy. And in Australia, we have some you know, real problems, um, uh, some other pandemics, if you like, and their diabetes, their cardiovascular disease, um, their, their cancers that we can do much better. We're doing very well in some, but can do much better in preventing. Um, and, and diabetes in particular, is so much related to, to, uh, to, to poor diets. Um, and yet um, we have seem to have so little control over what is being um, advertised, what is being sold. Uh, and just as I think Janet pointed out and, and Emma sort of followed on, unfortunately, you know, we're not really thinking about where's our food coming from. How is it manufactured? You know, how is it grown? How is it produced? How is it collected? How is it? And, and, um, uh, and, and then how do we prepare it and how do we eat it uh, in, in as healthy a way as possible as, you know, and at prices that are um, affordable as well. So they are all these sort of conflicting ideas or certain conflicting uh, issues, but we could do so much better in Australia um, if we were able to manage the saturation advertising that happens to all young Australians at the moment. Um, the sort of and it's particularly, I mean, interesting it's, that it's related to sport a lot, but um, where, you know, the, our young Australians are saturated with messages from the kings of Australian sport, um, whether it's, it doesn't matter what sport it is, then they are ramping up um, junk food, junk drinks. I mean, the whole, you know, sugar sweetened beverages, really, which absolutely, um, you know, calories that they call wasted, um, and, um, uh, and alcohol and gambling, as it turns out. Now, this is what happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when we used to have 14 uh, ads an hour at evening time for tobacco. Uh, we managed to control that, stop it. Australia has one of the lowest tobacco uh, rates, and it's one of the major reasons why uh, life expectancy has increased in Australia, and in fact, um, life has improved for, for many people um, who've done that. We have no control over that in, in these other... Uh, in these other areas, particularly around food. And a, perhaps a bit of context that um, 10 years ago, I was asked to chair the National Preventive Health Task Force on issues around diet and uh, physical activity and tobacco and alcohol. Um, and, you know, we didn't have to talk to tobacco companies because they were already by then persona non grata. Uh, but we did have to include the um, uh, junk food industries and, and, and alcohol. And I thought of that actually at the time, I thought, well, yeah, maybe we should. And, and they keep saying they're part of the solution. Well, it's interesting. In the in the ten years that I've watched that, or eleven years now, they've done absolutely. The industry and their associations have done absolutely everything they can to undermine any effective approaches to public health that would improve the nutrition um, and the diet of our Australian children, let alone um, adolescents and uh, uh, and and adults. I mean, whether it's around. Uh, really preventing an effective um, a packaging system where, you know, uh, front of packing, package, package labelling, uh, which doesn't exist, whether we could, like Mexico and, you know, 50 other countries around the world, introduce a, 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 a tax on sugar, which would then, it won't actually interrupt the sugar industry here, uh, but it will actually just help start to modify the huge consumption of sugar that we do have. Um, or whether it's, as I say, um, uh, reducing the advertising to young kids or whether it's actually starting to uh, really inform the community about what a good diet is uh, and even picking up Emma's point about where you know where, where good food comes from uh, and how you might be able to tap into that and learning about that um, we're completely avoiding that at the moment um, to our to the detriment of our of our 
health and our overall well-being. Thank you, Rob. We'll come back to Emma Gamano. Um, the what sort of problems are? I mean, first of all, when you go, uh, that you, do you get a space at the table when you're talking with high policy, or are you finding you're, you're not represented as you need to be um, in in terms of talking to government? I guess um, if we look at the role of the agricultural minister, um, both at a state level here in Victoria and federally, it's not that it's a nothing portfolio, but it certainly comes with no clout. Um, and it's something that is, I think, very, um, very important that that role of the agricultural minister is seen as being something that's more than just an advocate on behalf of the in industry to the government that's making a decision. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it, we need to take it more seriously because the the impacts that food policy and, and therefore agricultural policy have on things like um, human health and, and, and just to Rob's point, um, thinking about, you know, we're not only our people eating high processed, high sugar foods, even the way that the industry itself, the agriculture industry itself is developing um, things for all products, new products. So for example, fairy floss grapes is a variety. And these things are just so full of sugar um, and the nutrient, um, the impact, the nutrient impact, it's not something that the industry actually considers. So we're developing up these super sweet mandarins and, you know, the way that we're growing, we know that you eat an apple now and it doesn't have the same nutrients that it had 50 years ago. We know that the soils that we're actually um, producing our food on, they are degraded and they're depleted and we're putting a lot of um, synthetic fertiliser on them to get them to the point, even to the point where we start talking about um, innovating into say closed glasshouse facilities um, where you can control the environment essentially you've got food being grown grown on, a, on a, a dead medium I guess you know and it doesn't have the same nutrient profile as what food that's grown in healthy soils has so there's such a, a link between that public health piece and what we can do in regards to the way we're producing food that actually would reduce the costs and the burdens on our healthcare system if we were incentivizing farmers and farmers were in some way remunerated for caring about the nutrient profile, for caring about the soil that they're growing things on. But we just never seem to progress to that next step in the conversation. So it's all, always policy for the now or regulation for the now, but it's never forward thinking around if we just got 1% more uh, carbon in our soil, that the impact that that has on something like global warming is phenomenal. And yet there is no mechanism by which a farmer is rewarded for having more carbon in their soil. So it, it, that then um, leaves it to um, the intrinsic value that a farmer has in regards to taking care of their land and being stewards and, and you know, understanding the value of, okay, if I regenerate my soils and I farm in a different method, in fact, it's going to in five years or in 10 years time, it's going to be far more profitable for me. But you've got farmers that have got their back against the wall when it comes to debt and they can't make that transition now. So it's more of the synthetic fertilizers, more of the monoculture, more of the intensification. And it's actually going in the wrong, it's really genuinely going in the wrong direction, but we don't have any um, political or policy frameworks by which we can start thinking about farming in a different, from a different perspective. We went as an industry, you know, in the 50s, every farm was a mixed farm. You had a cow, that cow you milked, it had a calf, you ate the calf, you know, you had vegetables in the, in the garden, you had chickens there that put the manure on the soil for you. And it was this entirely closed loop system. And then we went off into this notion of intensification where when we get to a point where we can be having a dairy crisis, um, and I'm not undermining the pain and suffering that dairy farmers had gone through in that period of time and, and the, the time it takes to recover economically from that. But you can have a dairy crisis at the exact time, the same time that you've got a beef boom. And, I, you know, to keep it really simple, you know, they're both cows, they both have four legs, and yet we've developed one cow to give us, you know, 10 litres of milk per day or, or, or per milking, and we've, but nobody wants to eat that meat because it's too lean and it's too this and it's too that. And we've just totally disconnected our own closed system by which, you know, that permaculture system and we're encouraged to actually have that monoculture and that intensification rather than thinking about it from a totally different perspective. And until there's government policies and frameworks in place that change the, um, 
change what it means to be successful as a farmer, which is usually your bank balance rather than your fertility of your soil or the nutrient density of your food, um, then we're probably not going to be able to see farmers change because we've got those constraints where we just don't have enough capital in the system. In fact, all of the growth in agriculture over the last 40 years has actually is actually completely proportionate to the amount of debt that farmers have gone into. So we have literally gone into debt to fund our own growth, and that's just not sustainable. Now, Emma, let's get to the politics then, because um, somehow we've got to overcome, I mean, there's a, a city-rural divide, City people think that farmers are always whinging and always getting this and that. And, and yet, you know, the people who really are getting this and that are the fossil fuel industry. Um, they, there's a, a, the people have forgotten that, you know, country people do need, for instance, uh, help with the cost of their fuel. Um, that the, the distances in Australia require certain types of subsidy for, for, for fundamental activities in the same way that uh, they need support for their newspapers to continue or to have uh, the ABC still broadcasting because they absolutely de depend on the ABC. So, so, but we do we actually need now to start thinking about some sort of new accord and going back to what they did in the 1980s, where they brought together industry unions uh, to talk about a prices and wages accord. But do we now need an environmental accord, which brings together farmers and consumers and, uh, uh, and retail um, and policy, but also particularly universities, science, technology, um, to be able to start to have a national policy around food and to recognise and respect the problems that farmers have. I mean, I think I was very shaken last year at a meeting which was talking about what went wrong in the election and a woman stood up and said, look, I don't want to talk about Maribyrnong where I live. I want to talk about the Riverina where I grew up. And this is when the drought was still at its peak. And should I see the world I grew up in dying? and men dying and men killing themselves and families breaking and the land is finished. Now, we've got to accept that some parts of Australia are in that bad. So we've got to heal the land and we've got to do it by working together. So therefore, some sort of national policy which is going to help farmers financially. Now, you've suggested in your article things about tax breaks on things like payroll tax. Um, but you reject the idea of subsidies, but that is a form of subsidy, but that's maybe the most more helpful way of doing it to uh, farmers. Would you like to expand on that? Um, the rejection of the notion of subsidy is something that I really grappled with, and I um, travelled on a Nuffield scholarship, and at one point I was in, the, in a vehicle with, and we were travelling through France, and there was a French person, someone from New Zealand, someone from the US, and someone from Ireland, and we were having this argument around agricultural subsidies. Um, what I probably saw is that it's not to have a subsidy or to not have a subsidy. I, I think when I talk about frameworks, I actually think it's about remunerating people for doing something that is what you want as an outcome. So yeah. if what you want as an outcome is environmental protection, well, then you need to remunerate people for environment, environment, environmental protection. The other thing that we can't have is this notion that um, farmers must look after the environment, but you're not going to get paid any more for your product if you do so, because it actually does come at a high cost of production. Um, we've seen in some of those drought areas the difference between, you know, two farmers side by side, one who has taken on regenerative practices and has grass all over their entire farm and then the farm next door being completely barren. And that's actually something to do with, um, you know, the, the way that you're farming the land. Mm. I actually, think that rather than just saying subsidies can be very crude in that it's you've yeah. got a cow and so the government pays you this much money because you own a cow. But what you never learn is the most innovative, um, best practice way of managing that cow if you're paid just because you own it rather than being, I believe, remunerated for something that is outcome-based success. And that's not just about money for meat, it's about a whole other realm of things. Um, 
it's about creating a biodiversity scheme where farmers are rewarded for not clearing all of their land, but actually that I remember I put a, a post on Twitter. We've got um, the growling grass frog, the green growling grass frog, and they are prolific on our farm. And it turns out that I'd put something on Twitter and then someone from Melbourne university, a PhD student who's been looking for these grass frogs found out that I had these grass frogs and then come and studied the population here. So something that, um, we're being told is endangered well I mean I can I can go out into the paddock and find you you know we find them in cauliflowers we find them everywhere there's nothing that there is no framework that exists that rewards me as a farmer for caring about it my father for not clearing the land my you know he argued with my grandfather about leaving all the natural bushland around our uh, our creek that goes through our farm there's nothing that rewards that so if you, for the farmer that will never care about whether or not there's a growling grass frog and whether or not it goes extinct, you have to put something else in place. So for me, it's not necessarily about subsidy, but it's about, you know, this fundamental lack of understanding that what we do on farms is sequester carbon and we can choose how much we're going to take off in regards to product and how much we're going to leave, leave there. You know, there, there, we, the fact that we own, you know, more than 50% of the land mass, if you don't have farmers contributing to this solution, and if that takes remuneration in some form where a farmer is recognised for that, then you're just never going to change the dial. And right now, there's nothing other than, you know, the feel good factor. And maybe you can market that, oh, we're carbon neutral on our farm, or, you know, we're really kind to our animals. But beyond that, there's just no recognition. And until you remunerate what you want, then I just don't think that there'll be any change. But in regards to just straight up subsidy, I think it's dangerous because what I've seen it do is stifle innovation. And it also often keeps people farming because they particularly in the UK you see a whole lot of young farmers who really want to be passionate and, and be in the industry and they're locked out because the landowners are receiving all of these subsidies and of course yeah. never have to move off their farms so yeah not yeah. as simple as great subsidy but definitely yeah. we need to think about it. I mean a lot of the the, the whole extraordinary growth of, of processed food was really driven by Richard Nixon giving the corn farmers in America massive subsidies, which they still get in order to buy yep. their vote. And then now mm. you've suddenly got all this excess corn, which you shovel into cows, which makes them grow absurd sizes and they can't stand up on their poor little legs and the, cat, the, the chickens get gigantic and, uh, it, and the people get gigantic. You can actually map the increase in obesity yep in the United States year by year, creeping up from the South and from the Rust Belt and taking over the whole country. I wanna to get to this thing about policy because I've talked about to you each all about a new, the concept of a nutritional floor, um, which would include the fact that it would then consider farmers to be absolute partners in the national uh, enterprise. And the national enterprise is to maintain the, the common good of, and, and the prosperity and health and happiness of Australian people and the, the health and happiness of the land itself. Um, and I'm just wondering, Rob, if you, in your overseas work particularly, had much to do with countries where they do have, because they've experienced famine, they actually have to have a, a, a strong food policy so in the Indian state of Kerala, which does a lot of things very well and is an extremely successful poor, poor community, which has uh, got the best outcomes, health out got better outcomes than many states of the United States. Um, but they have fair price shops for their basics. In Egypt, um, the, the, the grains are subsidised to the, to the, to the uh, consumer, not to the... The, the, the not going to the farmer. Um, in thinking about a nutritional floor, if this were a national policy, and therefore there has to be effort, investment, support, thinking, research, going towards enabling farmers to flourish, to be innovative, and to be in control, uh, particularly of their region. Anything it's doing with the land has to be regional because of the ecology of that place. So you, you can't, I mean, Aboriginal people have their own languages groups all over the country. And each of those languages 
it comes from a particular ecology and we, mm. we do have to live the same way. But Rob, if you had any thoughts about this? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not a great uh, expert in this area at all, but, but it does make a lot of sense in terms of, of um, um, really knowing, knowing the land from which, you know, which we, where our food is produced. And I think, I mean, even just tonight, it's thinking that how much more we should be directly communicating and, 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 um, uh, and working with um, food producers. I mean, um, I don't think we do enough uh, of that at all. It's, it's, it's starting and there's a, there's a greater appreciation that within health circles, but I just don't think that the partnership is nearly as strong because there's so many um, policy outcomes, Emma, that you've been talking about that are actually identical um, in terms of what, what we, what I would see as, a, as I said before, as a preventologist, um, and and what you'd you'd see as a um, as a as a farmer, and and you know I think uh, one country that I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but the Dutch seem to do this pretty well, mm. um, and uh, it's interesting knowing some of the Dutch big seed producers who are actually in Australia. Um, uh, that you'd know of Emma, but uh, I mean, they do fabulous work in terms of, of actually um, producing very uh, new varieties, um, uh, really interesting varieties that are actually very fresh food uh, and yet can be produced um, uh, more cheaply. Um, uh, and they really, and, and obviously their sort of production in, in, in Holland is incredible compared to the actual land they have. So there, yeah, there's so much I think that we can probably learn um, from other places. Emma, I just wonder what you think about that. Yeah, um, I, and even um, Janet, you were talking about Kerala and I actually went there and, and the, the, it, it's about a cultural mentality, you know, and that's the same. The Dutch are just innovative people. They mm. had that burning platform of yep. we don't have enough land, yep. you know, we, who are we, what is our place in the world? Let's just go and reclaim some of the sea. I mean, like, yeah. where, who, who thinks of this stuff? But where yeah. government puts something on the agenda and, and says, this is what is important to us, you see results. And that's exactly what's happened in the Netherlands. It's the yeah. same as in New Zealand. The government put agriculture on the agenda and now they're getting, you know, far greater um, outcomes in regards to the environmental way that they, you know, the, the interaction with the environment in regards to how they farm and the markets that they're opening up and the image that they have internationally. You know, even you were talking about, subsidies to the consumers um australian merino sheep go into qatar because the qatari government as part of their food strategy have said well actually australian merino sheep are the um are the, the cheap sheep i suppose as opposed to they're a wasi traditional sheep and that's given to all of their um workers who are from pakistan and um bangladesh and and wherever else and and it works because it makes sure that th that workforce is kept well fed and, and whatever else but uh, it's about like making something a priority. And to the point in Kettler, um, I went to one farm that I just, it just, I was so impressed by their notion of what scarcity drives this, this innovation. And I guess it's the same with even, I've come from a migrant family where you just simply don't waste things. There is no such thing as waste. Me and dad trying to clean out a shed together is a disaster because nothing is rubbish to him. There's always going to be a, a reason piece of string could be used for something or that piece of wood will be the right size for something eventually okay. and that's how they've been in, in Kerala and I saw a man who had uh, coconut trees and under his coconut trees he had nutmeg trees and he you know traditionally the fruit around the nutmeg is actually wasted so he started candying that because why would you bother wasting it and then from his coconuts he actually started using the hull and then created a rope factory and everything again works so that there's just no there's no wastage in the system. If we could reduce wastage in the developed countries, we'd just about solve most of the problems that we're, we're trying to be really creative about here. And it's actually just that mentality around scarcity. And Australia has always been, or has been for a long time, a very lucky country for most, um, most people, most Anglos and most migrants that have, have, have come here. And it's just never created that need to be innovative around waste. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think you're right, Emma. We're, in a sense, too lucky to be innovative. Um, yeah. You know, it's the fact we sit on so much brown coal, uh, which yeah. is the biggest cause of our problem in, in managing uh, uh, 
um, climate change, to be honest. I mean, and, and uh, you know, there's so much land. We haven't really thought about uh, innovation of, of, uh, uh, that, that Emma's been talking about. And that's what, when you do watch other countries um, and, and what they can actually do and think through these issues, then, then we can do that too. Well, you do yeah, more land clearing here. If you if you want to expand or get you you just do more land clearing. Yeah, yeah. just makes the that situation worse. Mm. Um, exactly. Look yeah. at Israel. That's another country that yeah. is just incredible. I'm surrounded yeah. by their yeah. their enemies, and they're they're feeding themselves in the desert, and it is incredible to see. But it's it's born out of that need, and you're mm. quite right. What we do, we be really lazy. Our politicians are totally lazy. It comes to mm -hmm. setting climate targets. Like, for goodness sake, there has been backflipping on, on climate and energy and national energy scheme and all of that stuff for years upon years. And it just it's just sheer laziness because we don't have yeah. to come up with an answer. We'll just dig another hole for now and, and, and we'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah. No, so Emma Dawson, uh, is your policy wonk, Mike Brian, <laughs> kicking over? Can you start to pull this together in a, into a narrative that... that uh, we could try and sell to some political parties. Well, that's that's the hope, isn't it? I think yeah. that that last point from both Rob and Emma is really critical. Is that we have, you know, we have been the lucky country, and that and that the way that that phrase was coined originally by Donald Horn is um, the way that it should be understood today. The the luck has actually made us very lazy and very negligent of the kind of. Um, uh, strategic thinking and and. Um, systems design that the most successful countries engage in and you know the Netherlands and, and Israel are two fantastic examples there we do see I think some business and industry sectors going it alone um, absent any policy framework yeah. from the federal government so um, you know the lack of a coherent energy policy um, in this country or of a coherent um, system policy around renewables, uh, the toing and froing over that for, for 10 or 15 years has been an absolute crime in terms of the investment needed and the support needed for primary industries, for agriculture, for growers. And yet you still see some really innovative Australian companies um, growing tomatoes in the desert in, in South Australia, you know, using, using cutting edge hydroponics to do that, despite them not getting any uh, kind of industry support to, to develop those technologies. So we have some of the best researchers and the best scientific minds in this country, and we have some of the most committed um, industry players. Our agriculture sector is world leading. You know, our, our food producers are not only produce enough to feed this country, but to, you know, feed another 40 million people or something else around the world, as Emma says in her chapter. Um, and they're largely doing this absent government support and yeah. absent yeah. regulatory support for the last, at least the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, and I think the big challenge for us now is to say, look, uh, markets are moving regardless of what government wants. Whether you, you want to argue whether climate change is real or whether there's a future in coal or whatever, you can have those arguments in the parliament as long as you want to. Increasingly, people are tuning out from them and trying to get on with doing it anyway. But we're making it that much harder for our producers to compete on the world stage and to really get the benefits of you know, we have the, the greatest natural resources of any country in the world, not just those fossil fuels we can dig up and ship off, but we have salt, we have sunlight, we have wind, we have beautiful land, we have a really um, varied um, climate and a very varied land mass. We have, you know, in any other part of the world, we, there would be 17 or 18 countries on the landmass that we call Australia. And so to allow each region to play to its strengths and to develop the industries that we know are needed in order for us to become not just a self-sustaining country in the future, but a, a genuinely mature player on the world stage, um, it's not inevitable that that will happen, but at the moment it's happening despite government rather than because of it. Um, and so one, one of the things that the book really does is try to, um, to make an argument for bringing all of these 
issues together and recognising that we are so lucky to live in a country like Australia and we're squandering that luck, you know, that our producers still do an amazing job. But imagine what we could do if we had the kind of strategic thinking and innovation and investment incentives that they have in Israel or in the Netherlands or in, in, in those countries that really have been forced to innovate. I think there are people in state and federal governments who get it. I don't think there are enough of them. And I think there's too much politics in what, what should be and what are anywhere else in the world, really, other than here and in America, nonpartisan issues. You know, the fact that climate change and action on climate change has become a partisan issue is absurd because it's the environment. You know, we, we, we don't get, the, the environment doesn't care what your ideology is. Um, we, we really need to, to move beyond that argument. And one of the reasons that the book is concerned with what's next I think is because both you and I, Janet, felt we don't want to re-prosecute those arguments about whether climate change is happening and who's responsible for it. We want to say, well, look, we need to move beyond that and go to what we need to do to ensure our future. Um, and the, everyone that's written for this book gets that, intrinsically gets that and understands that it's not, a cho it's not an option. You know, there really aren't the kinds of options that politicians like to pretend there are. The politicians that say, oh, we'll keep the coal industry going for 40 years when there's unlikely to be any international demand for coking coal um, in 20 or 30 years time. Um, that, that, that politicians that say, oh, well, we won't let X, Y or Z industry die, um, but we won't support A, B or C industry because it doesn't fit our ideology. Uh, eventually the market will move without them. Um, but what will then happen if we don't have a coherent national framework is that we don't, we don't make the best decisions and we don't ensure that the majority of Australians benefit from those decisions. So this book, as much as anything else, is a plea to policymakers to see just the potential that's out there and the fantastic thinking and the fantastic skills and abilities that we have in this country and to say, get behind it and stop holding things back. Thank you, Emma. Um, Genevieve, we don't seem to have any questions. So I was wondering to ask. I, to have, uh, I have a question from Lisa. All right. Lisa was wondering, uh, how does the strategy fit with all the important food supply chains owned by many overseas companies? Uh, milk companies might be a good example. Who's the question to? It's, I, I'm uh, gonna have to jump yeah, I think it's a, an Emma D, Emma G question. Better you than me, Emma. Yeah. I, you know, again, my insides tell me that there's something wrong where you can come to Australia and you can buy just about anything. You can buy our land, you can buy our water, and it doesn't matter where you come from. And the, and the national vetting um, of those investments is is fairly poor, as we've seen with the Foreign Investment Review Board and things like that. Um, and some of the uh, unintended consequences we've seen in dairy in Tasmania and, you know, people making promises that they're going to reinvest back into regions and in an Australian workforce and, and that, you know, subsequently doesn't happen. Um, you can't do that in a lot of other countries. I can't go to China and buy myself a parcel of land or buy myself a company and do whatever I want. Um, having said that, I do understand as a farmer that you need to have the capacity to grow. So we need the money to come from somewhere. I actually think that if we start thinking about what the solution is, which is where, what do we want it to look like and how do we, again, how do we incentivise that, you actually will get rid of some of those things that we, we don't like. I, I agree that we don't like to see our water being owned by foreign nationals or our, our food supply chains being owned by foreign nationals, but in lieu of any other investment, I don't think it's fair to stop a farmer or a farming business um, being able to sell. The, the thing that stops uh, uh, someone who is not Australian buying the farm next door is me having the financial capacity to buy it myself. So if you do make Australian farmers and those Australian companies um, successful and, and lucrative, they've got the capacity to do the buying of those bigger businesses. Right now we have a lack of investment, of Australian investment into those food supply chains. So it invites or it leaves the space for the outsiders to come. And I don't mean to sound so um, binary that they're outsiders, we're insiders, because I think, you know, as much as we're talking about Australia, there's, there's something here that we're talking about food across the globe and being human beings that are global citizens. Um, so it's a bit beyond just where you come from. But again, we've got to make sure that it's, you know, we have to identify what's national interest and then we've got to ensure that we encourage the right things to happen. So um, 
there was a point in time we considered before I actually came back onto the farm and, and it was decided that way we, we were thinking, you know, mum and dad were maybe considering selling up and we had some Chinese parties come to the farm and, and I looked at dad and I thought, you know, you've worked a lifetime, you should have the right to sell the farm if you want to you know, you shouldn't be trapped here just because the only person that's going to come and buy from you is a Chinese person, but you feel uncomfortable about that. But again, if the neighbour next door is not buying from you, then that, that's the outcome that happens. So farmers need access to capital. We need to see Australian superannuation companies actually opening their opening their investments to Australian farmers. We need green bonds. We need Australia to be a secure market that people want to invest in. Um, and we need to be able to better explain long-term investment or return on investment in agriculture because it's not a short-term gain so there's no can we get 18 percent return in, in 12 months time no you can't but you know there's no safer investment than the farm and i think australian farmers have proven their resilience despite natural disasters and global pandemics and, um you know lack of labor and no government supportive policy we have to be able to tra um, translate that value to australian investors themselves and then i think um you'll end up with better competition in that market and you might not have to ban the foreign investment because if we did that right now, it would be to the um, industry's detriment. Can I, I think that's just an excellent point about, you know, what we need here is long-term strategic investment and Australia has in its superannuation sector, you know, this incredible pool of funds. It's a trillion dollars now sitting in, in superannuation. Um, it's the envy of the world in terms of its, its ability to have that long-term savings vehicle. And the, the need for quick returns isn't there for super, right? For, for those big superannuation companies, they can have lower rates of return, but they want a secure return and something that's going to lo be long lasting. Um, and I think there are two areas in which superannuation should absolutely be leading investment. And one is agriculture and food production, and the other is affordable um, housing um, for, for key workers. Uh, it's a no brainer to me that we've got this massive pool of funds sitting there. We're using it to invest overseas. You know, we're actually investing oh, yeah. in yeah. American markets. Airports in the US. I mean, it's yeah. you know, a large yeah. office in, in, uh, in New York, um, mm -hmm. channeling a whole lot of superannuation funds into the, in the US and, and, and you're quite right, missing out um, where we should be uh, investing. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's actually our money, you know, it's, it's Australian yeah. citizens' money. Um, and the, the benefit of, of investing that locally in something as secure and reliable and fundamental as food production and agriculture, to me, seems a no-brainer. Yeah. Part of the green bonds are a great way to do it though, Emma, aren't they? Yeah, and, but part of the problem is also farmers being investment ready. So you still, you know, nine out of 10 farms are still family farms and most of them can't easily, again, communicate the, the value, the return, the, the future plans. And so there needs to be investment in, um, I mean, we need people, human capital, there is nothing more important than it. And it's not just, I mean, it starts from the fact that we, we literally need the unskilled person who picks the cauliflower, you know, slices it with a machete, it's no more glamorous than that, puts it in a carton and gets it off to market. That person is vital in the supply chain, um, just as the farm owner and manager is vital in understanding those numbers and actually being able to make smart financial decisions with farms. A family farm very much becomes a member of the family. And sometimes that actually drives poor financial decisions in regards to how you would do business. And I remember when I first came back on the farm, I'd had an argument with another farmer saying, well, all of you farmers, you're so attached to your land. That's why you make bad decisions. That's why you don't make enough money and you should all stop whinging, you know, if you actually just try to do business. And that was at the beginning of it. And then, you know, subsequently being on the farm and getting that attachment, not just from the family perspective, but to the land itself, you know, a personal relationship with the land itself that I have now, it's because of that attachment that farmers are resilient and they go a season after drought and they, they're they out there pulling calves in the middle of the night. They The commitment to a farm is something that's that's incredible, but it, it somehow has to be balanced so that we are investment ready and we are investment worthy because you also can't just give money away to, to families and then just hope for the best. So there's got to be an increase in financial knowledge um, across the farming sector. Yeah, yeah. Joined, joined by a little guest. Uh, no, and I think one of the one of the themes in our book it opens, of course, Janet, with the chapter from Thomas Mayer about the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and really that connection to land that First Nations Australians have, 
um, is a lesson for all of us. And, uh, you know, perhaps farmers are the only other sector of society that understands that, that lives in such a connected way with the land and needs to have that, that kind of mutual respect and that attachment that goes beyond purely what's financial, um, but goes to what we value. And I think that's a really strong theme in our book and why we kicked off with that chapter is, is, is that we want to see a future in which we value things differently. We value those connections, those, we value our communities, we value the way that we care for one another and care for the land that, that nurtures us. Um, and there's a lot we can learn from, from First Nations people um, in that regard. But, you know, it, it obviously informs everything that, that you know, I mean, I've got families, a, fam a family who are farmers down where you are actually, um, uh, in Hearns Oak, not, not quite as, not quite Merby North, but that, you know, multi-generational connection to the land that's just starting from settler Australians has been part of First Nations experience um, and something we can really learn from. Mm. Yeah, and that's, I, I, it was a beautiful chapter and it was a lovely way to open. Um, and it's unfortunate, and we were having this conversation actually before everybody else joined us, but I was talking about a, a mineral sand mine that they want to put in an area in Gippsland and... Um, I was down there representing the Farmers Federation for the farmers that are saying, no, absolutely no mineral sand mine. We don't want it threatening our water supply. We've got a beautiful horticulture um, industry here. We've got all of this clean, green. We don't want to mine here. And I, I was really struggling from the perspective of, well, now we're the Indigenous people on the land who ultimately displaced others in order to have this land to call our own. And now we're the people who are going to be forced off again. And it's so difficult. Like I, I personally, as a, as a landowner, as a title holder, find it really difficult to reconcile that within myself. And, and I think that um, even Australian agriculturalists need to also embrace that Indigenous knowledge as well. There's so much about the land that just teaches the people that are on it that there is a real commonality and particularly when we saw um, the bushfires and, and how much how much was lost in the bushfires and you've had farmers and Indigenous leaders together saying for a long time this is not how to manage the land so you know we need to have a stronger tie I think to the Indigenous community because that notion of there being the dreaming and there's something beyond that just the constitution the land itself has its own story and its own value and its own spirit if you like that we need to actually care for and embrace. And it has to be something that's just part of the Australian culture and vernacular that it's not completely bizarre to think about the land as, have, as being its own entity. Yeah. I did ask to, to the Macareta, um, Macarata, which they, is, is the reconciliation. And so somehow we need a national reconciliation with First Nations, with each other, with the land, um, and in doing so, we also are honouring our health and in, improving our, our, our well-being of everyone. Um, and so in tying that all together, um, of course, the economists would say that you could measure this in economic outcome, uh, that in fact, if you've got a healthier population, you get a better economy. Uh, you are spending less on health. If you're a preventologist, uh, you're actually saving a huge amount of money. Um, little old Cuba with all its problems, its poverty and its totalitarian government nonetheless uh, spends 90% of its health, health budget on prevention and, and does better than the United States yeah. in expectancy. Um, so it's another, uh, like Kerala, um, an example where you don't have to be rich to be actually to lead a good life. And so somehow we've got to now in this rebuilding after COVID, find this common ground and, and be talking about nurturing life, nourishing life in the way that, that a farmer or a, a, a person living with the land and so on and, and, and nourishing life as human beings. So we could, I think, have we got any other questions, Genevieve? Oh. There is one more question. Um, no, um, and I think before we wrap up, which was from Toby asking, the budget was the major opportunity to, to shift, but yet we got more of the same. What will really shift the big money? <laughs> Emma, Emma Dawson. Hey. Um, only the people will shift the politics. Uh, ultimately, Politicians go where the people lead them um, fundamentally. So one of the 
the really um, important movements behind this book for myself and Janet, and I think everyone that contributed, is that we want this to be a national conversation that involves everybody. Um, I think the budget was disappointing in a lot of ways. Uh, it was very much a business as usual budget targeted at um, supply side economics in the hope that some of that support would trickle down to people on the ground, but it, it missed opportunities to really grapple with the, the issues that have been facing us now for, for you know at least 15, 20 years, if not longer, um, quite apart from the recession brought about by the pandemic. And so I think it's only when we have conversations like this and we have more of them and we and we reach out to people that aren't necessarily going to jump on a, on a bookshop zoom on a on a Tuesday, Tuesday it's a Tuesday night isn't it I'm in Melbourne the days and months have lost all meaning um, but actually have those conversations in regional communities in in local communities um, across the outer suburbs with the people that because the, fundamentally Every Australian, with a you know a few exceptions, there are a few nut jobs amongst us. There are always nut jobs in every society, but most of us want a secure, peaceful, prosperous life that our children can inherit from us and have the same kinds of standard of living. They want to see the land taken care of. Um, they want their neighbours to do as well as they want as they want to do themselves. Um, and so we need to drive that conversation about well, what kind of country do we want to be? Um, do we want to be a country that just digs stuff up out of the ground and ships it off overseas and then enriches five to ten percent of us and the rest of us struggle on and, and, you know, don't make the most of our opportunities? Or do we want to be the kind of country that is innovative and forward looking and provides opportunity to every kid, no matter their background, and allows them to, to be their best and has the ac access, as we, as we are fortunate enough to be in this country, to the freshest food and the cleanest water and the cleanest air? Um, and it's a no brainer, right? It's everyone's going to, most sensible people are going to opt for the second choice. So really, until we get that, that understanding that this is the kind of country we want to be and there are steps that need to be taken to get there and apply that pressure um, and make that an issue on which votes will turn then once we do that the government will follow so it's I don't I don't believe in top-down solutions I believe in bottom-up solutions everything needs to come from the community and from the people um, nothing has ever changed without a uh, mass of people behind it and that's where our power lies thank you Emma Rob, have you got a last word? You switched, you switched off. Yeah. No, no, I'd certainly endorse um, Emma's, Emma's notion of, of what makes a good Australia and what makes a, a truly lucky Australia. Um, and it is, a, it is a commitment to, to, you talked about it before, the commons, you know, what's common amongst us. Um, you know, the notion that we, we need to work together, we need to support each other. And that's why I always like, um, uh, I get my rates. I actually took a photo once when I, I got them and, and sort of held them and said, I love paying my rates. <laughs> why? Because I've lived in enough places where we don't pay rates, you get nothing. You know, there is a notion of, of a progressive tax system is a contribution to the greater good. And the more that we can contribute, the more that we actually invest in public uh, infrastructure in public um, health, welfare, whatever you like, in mean, public transport. I mean, you look at, we've measured this, we looked at the 20, uh, 20 different indexes of well being um, that were commonly used. And then we ranked countries and which ones were doing the best. And pretty much they all came back as the, the Scandinavians, Northern Europeans, Japan, Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Why? Because they had the highest levels of commitment to the public good. Um, and, you know, we're actually watching the complete opposite of this in the US at the moment as it fractures a society driven by inequality. And you measure all forms of inequality and you'll ramp up all forms of, of uh, uh, um, lower well-being and lower health. So, you know, basically the whole notion of, of, the, of the common good is about a healthy good and a, and a well good as well. Thank you. Emma Germano, do you want to say a last word? Oh, only that 
um, I think it's encouraging. And I really, that, that notion of um, grassroots, like we, we it, it's not only necessarily like the best way to do it, but it's, it's the only way to do it now. I think we've lost inspirational leaders getting to the top. This party politics, the, the dog whistling, the this side versus that side, you know, it's gonna take the, um, the community itself to actually ask or demand from our politicians that they lead us in a different way because, you know, it's not sustainable like this. It's literally flip-flopping on policy positions. So the more that we can get um, leaders in the community to come together and agree on positions, uh, and, and often people who would ordinarily disagree on positions, uh, that's, I think, where the sweet spot is going to be. And um, the, the book is very encouraging because a lot of minds came together and said a lot of the same things and, and had the same values at heart. So hopefully there is a hope for the future, but we've got to hold those people leading us to account. Thank you very much, Amana. I think um, maybe we go and talk to the Country Women's Association. It's one of the great grassroots connectors oh, yeah. um, we've got in this country. Genevieve, thank you very much for this opportunity for us to talk to avid readers. Um, I hope that we've uh, provided some stimulation anyway. Thank you so much for all this, your insight. I have asked everyone to unmute. So if you wouldn't, if you're able to join us in a round of applause or a thank you uh, to, to our panelists before we say good night. But yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Thank you.